Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Listen now for the word of the Lord. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know it, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord is sending me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And so they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets of Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And, as he re and he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over it on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire um, appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up into heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him, and they bowed down before him. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and awesome are you, Almighty God, and we thank you for the fathers of our faith, mothers and fathers of our faith, those who have gone before us, who have shown us the way, those who have modeled for us what it is like to be faithful men and women, even prophets, God, who have spoken forth the truth of God in our own lives. Thank you, God, for those, for their lives, for their witness, for the ways that they served you. And now bless us and help us to receive God a portion of your spirit, that we too might carry on the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, God. Amen. There's a story of a, um, a man, and he went driving in the country one day, and um, everything was so beautiful around him, and you know how it is when you drive down River Road in the springtime? Isn't it beautiful? Just keep that in mind. The buds are going to come, even after the snow. Uh, and, and you drive along, and it's hard. Uh, I remember last year, my first spring, being your pastor, and driving down River Road in the morning, I really had to concentrate on driving because the, everything was so beautiful. I kept kind of going like this. Well, evidently, that man, as he was driving in the country that day, was looking all around, not really paying as much attention to his driving. It ended up in the ditch. Fortunately, he was unharmed, but his car was stuck. About that time, he saw a farmer working around in his field, and he went over and he said, can you help me? And the farmer said, well, I got this old mule, Dusty. I think Dusty can pull you out. So the old farmer went to the shed and got the mule, Dusty, and brought him out, and they hooked him up to the car. And um, when he was all ready, he said, all right, pull, Jack. Pull, Tom. Pull, Nellie. Pull, Dusty. And Dusty just kicked up his heels and pulled that car right out of the ditch. And the man was so appreciative, and he thanked the old farmer, and he said, but there's one thing I'm curious about. 
Why, when you were ready for Dusty to pull, did you call, our, all, call him all those other names? He said, well, old Dusty doesn't see so well anymore. And if he thought he was doing it by himself, he wouldn't have pulled so hard. <laughs> You know, when we think about faith, sometimes we think about faith and we think about it in such a selfish way. We think about me and Jesus. I had a roommate one time who was an awesome Christian. And, and I looked at her life and she studied the Bible more than anybody I've ever known, I think. She spent hours and hours and hours. I'd come home from work and find her on the couch with her Bible and her study notes and I'd be like, oh man. I wish I had that kind of study habits in my life. And, you know, I'd be going off to church or to work camp in the summer to work with the kids. I'd take my vacation time and I'd go to Harvest of Hope events and I'd work out in the hot, sweaty potato fields and I'd learn about world hunger and stuff like that. And I'd come back home and my roommate was still on the couch studying her Bible. And I thought, man, I wish I had that kind of faith to know God's Word that way. But you know what I realized as I grew in my faith? was that that roommate had a relationship with Jesus Christ that was just about her. And you know, Jesus loves you. I don't, I don't want to make any mistake, and I don't want to cause any confusion today. So I want to tell you right now, Jesus loves you. I want you to hear that as if you hear it for the very first time. Listen to it one more time. Jesus loves you. And if it had only been you that were a sinner, Jesus still would have died on the cross for you. So your faith is personal. And your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ is personal. And your salvation and the love that Jesus has for you and the love that you have for Jesus is personal. But if you stop there, you really miss what faith is all about. You've heard me say it before when I've prayed. I've, I've prayed, God, give us a hunger for your word. Give us a hunger to be in worship together. Give us a hunger to be in prayer. It's not so that we can be big, fat Christians, you know, because if all you do is you take in and you take in and you take in, all you do is puff up. But if you truly understand what the word of God <coughs> says to you, if you truly understand what the love of Jesus Christ is about, then you will recognize that faith in Jesus Christ, while it is personal, it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do in the world, in and through the love that you have in Christ Jesus. I used this illustration once before, but I want to use it one more time. This is a cross I bought at a Cokesbury tent sale. Um, apparently it's been tried to be glued over and over again. That's why it was at the tent sale, because the glue wouldn't hold. And I brought it home and I thought, well, Maurice can fix that. He can fix everything. But you know, when I started thinking about it, I really like the fact that it comes apart like this. Because it reminds me, the cross of Jesus Christ is to remind us about what? The yeah, the crucifixion, the love of Jesus, the love that Jesus has for me. But when Jesus died on the cross, he made it possible for us to have some relationships. He made it possible for us to have this vertical relationship. This represents the relationship that you and I have with God. Not possible without Jesus Christ. Because over and over and over again, God tried to let the people know how much he loved them. And over and over again, people have sinned. You and I have sinned. Without Jesus Christ dying for our sin, we wouldn't be able to have the right relationship that we can have with God. So this part of the cross reminds us of that relationship with God. It would not be a cross if it was just this piece. Do you get that? <coughs> the horizontal part of the cross is all about the relationships that we have through Jesus Christ with other people. Reaching out. If we only understand this part of the cross, we miss the true essence of faith. The true essence of faith was that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should have life and life everlasting. But that's not where faith ends. Faith continues with Jesus Christ down on his knees before his disciples, washing their feet, serving them so that they will know, as Jesus taught them, as I have served you, you must also serve others. Reach out. 
relationships. Faith is not a solitary journey. If you're a note taker, write that down. Faith is not a solitary journey. Faith is meant to be shared in community. And let me prove it to you. There are several, I mean, the scripture is full of illustrations of that, but let me just give you a few. Um, if you were there yesterday, sorry, you're going to hear it again. This is Acts chapter 2, right after Pentecost has happened, and the disciples are filled with God's grace. What do they do? They all gather together, and it's not just the disciples, but it's now other people who have begun to hear the message of God. And this is about the fellowship of the believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, to, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. Selling their possessions and their goods, they gave to anyone as they had need. And every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number every day those who were being saved. That's evidence that even after Pentecost, when God, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he told the disciples, wait here, I'm sending someone to be with you. And when the, when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon people, it came to create the community of believers, the body of Christ. And we are part of that body, and we have in common the things of our faith. From Mark chapter 6. Um, this is about Jesus. Um, Jesus has been teaching the disciples. So Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out. One by one? Was it one by one? No. Two by two, and he gave them authority over evil spirits. He did not send them out one by one. Well, you would think, well, if Jesus had sent the disciples out in 12 different directions, they could have covered a lot more territory. But they were meant to be in companionship and partnership together. Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. Let's see what we got back here. From Hebrews. Don't lose my little paper. Got things marked on them. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. Faith is not a solitary journey. The prophet Elijah knew that. Everywhere he traveled in that scripture, Bethel, Jericho, um, all the places that he went that Elisha followed him to, he had followed, he had followed the master Elijah around for years and had served and had grown and had known him. But now came the time when Elijah was going up into heaven to be with God. And Elisha was left there. But when Elijah was taken into heaven, he left his cloak behind, his mantle behind, so that Elisha could take it out. And when Elisha took up the mantle of Elijah, he struck the water, just like he had seen his master do. And the waters parted for him, just as they had for Elijah. And all those gathered there recognized that the prophet's ministry, Elijah, continued on in his servant, Elisha. You and I are meant to take up the mantle of faith. So that we can live it. So that we can share it. So that we can continue to be in ministry. I called one of my mentors this week. <clears throat> there are a couple of um, <coughs> women clergy um, who are, there, there are generations of women clergy. This is probably 50 some years since um, women were allowed to be ordained in the United Methodist Church. And so there's this whole generation of women in ministry who have gone before me. And I know this is your first women, woman pastor for most of you. And I know that some of you were like, I don't know about this. Some of you still going, I don't know about this. <laughs> Sorry, you, it is what it is. But those women who have gone in the generation of ministry before me had to be the ones to say, we are women and we are here to stay. And that had to be their agenda, sort of. They had battles to fight because people didn't want a woman for a minister. And I am so grateful for that generation that went ahead because I don't have to mess with that stuff. 
You know, I apologize for who I am. I am who I am, and I know that God has called me, and God has called me to a time such as this, to be in ministry and partnership with you. And so I'm so grateful for those women in ministry who've gone ahead of me. Um, about, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, I had the opportunity to go out to California. There was a conference, a national conference of clergy women. Now, normally I go, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't have an agenda about being a clergy woman. But what a neat opportunity to gather with other clergy women. And so it was an awesome conference, just incredible worship. All of the female bishops in the United Methodist Church were there. There were women from all over the world. It wasn't just a national conference as I thought it was. It turned out to be an international conference. And there we were, worshiping God and celebrating together. And one night, all the women from the Virginia Conference got together for dinner. And I met this new person who I'd never met. I ended up sitting next to this woman named Teresa. And um, I said something in our conversation over dinner about being a preacher's kid and, and um, you know, about where I was serving and what God was doing. And we were sharing our ministries back and forth. And, and later in our conversation, she said, who is your parent in ministry? And I really think, in hindsight, she wanted to know who my daddy was. But at the moment, while we were sitting around the table with these women in ministry, I pointed to two women. I said, that one Rhonda and that one Cheryl, they're my mothers in ministry. Because they've been my mentors. There are people that I had the privilege to work with. Cheryl is one that I talked to this week. She was um, my college chaplain. And she followed my dad to Stony Creek. My dad served the churches in Stony Creek, Sharon and Fort Grove. You, a lot of you know where that is, right down the road. And um, she followed my daddy. My daddy wasn't sure about women in ministry even. My mom said, you better get over that because I think Michelle's going to end up one. And I laughed at both of them. And, uh, but Cheryl, when I was in college, Cheryl would say to me, you know, I think you have gifts and graces for ministry. And I would go, yeah, right. <laughs> Well, I learned as I talked to Cheryl, and, and over the years, she encouraged me and, and grew me up in the faith, and so she's definitely one of my mamas in ministry. And, and I learned this week when I talked to her that she's planning to retire in a year. And I went, wait a minute, you can't retire. You're way too young to retire. She said, honey, I'm 65, and I'm tired of church stuff. <laughs> I'm going to retire next year. And I, and I just couldn't believe that she was old enough to retire but then I was so grateful that God allowed me to journey in faith with her at some point. Because in a lot of ways, she passed on the faith of Jesus Christ. And in a lot of ways, the woman who I am, who is a lot to know yet still, who has a lot to grow yet, I am by no means perfect. I have a lot to learn still. But because of the gifts of some of these people who passed the mantle to me, I am able to love God and to serve God the way that I am. Amen. You and I are not meant to be solitary Christians. We are meant to live our life and our faith in community. We are meant to pray for one another. We are meant to worship together. We are meant to call one another when we didn't see them in church last Sunday. I can't do all that. You think I can do all that by myself? That's your job as part of the community. Look around right now. Really, look around. <laughs> I mean it. Turn, turn your head. It won't hurt. Look around. And don't look just to see who is here, but look, look again. Uh, stand up. Go ahead. Look around to see who's not here today. Who do you know who's not here? All right? Don't tell me. You got it? You see somebody who's not here? Of course you don't see them, because they're not here. <laughs> Sit down. It's your job. If you haven't seen somebody, and, and if you can't picture them right now, go home and pull out your church directory. Don't just pull out the picture one. Pull out the paper along with the, because all the pictures aren't in there anymore. Go out and pull the, and some of you don't look like the pictures in the book anyway. Uh, go back home and pull out the paper one that's got everybody's name and address. And look down the list and say, you know what? You know who I haven't seen in a while? When was the last time you sent Josie a card? 
Josie hadn't been able to come to church in a long time. And, and right after she was sick, we all were really good about sending her cards and stuff like that. Um, when was the last time you sent her a card? When was the last time you saw, uh, see, I can't even think right now, so y'all can't picture them either. Who? Jimmy and Nita Moneymaker. Um, when was the last time you saw them? It's been several weeks because it um, turns out Nita's having bad trouble with her knees. So she needs you to call her and, and send her cards. Take her some food. She doesn't need to stand in the kitchen to cook for that man. She needs your help. Please. Well, yeah. But he needs some help, too. He's a good man. He's a good man. He needs some help. There are people who need to know that you care about them, that you love them. And you know what? There are people sitting right here in this room right now that need to know you care about them. There are people that need you to notice that they showed up today. There are people that need you to notice if they showed up by themselves or not today. I'm not just talking about you, Carly, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> there are people today who are hurting as they sit in their seats. Who need somebody just to say, hey, I love you. I'm so glad to see you today. Faith is not a solitary journey. God calls each and every one of us to be a part of the body of Christ. <coughs> it entails, it is a great privilege, but it entails responsibility too. Yesterday at our meeting, I love chocolate. Have I told you that? <laughs> I love, see, I love way too much chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate, and so um, the day after Valentine's Day, I went to Food Lion and bought the leftover chocolate. <laughs> I did, because I love you people. <laughs> and, um, and I put it in little bowls on our tables yesterday, because when I'm in a long meeting, I like to have a piece of candy or something, you know, or if you get bored, you can stack up all the little pieces of candy you can or something. I saw y'all get bored yesterday sometimes. Um, so I put these candy bowls on the tables, and there were two. There were five tables, and there were two candy bowls on each table, and it had good stuff in it. If you like hard candy, it was in there. If you like sugar-free, sorry, I didn't get any of that. If you like chocolate, it was in there. If you like chocolate with peanuts in it, it was in there. If you just like the little kisses, just plain and simple, and you just need one little thing, it was in there. And I set those bowls on the table, and when people came in, I noticed over at Terry and Cher and Shipe's table, there were only four people. Two big balls of candy. Amy was at that table too. And um, and I went over and I got a piece of candy and they said, wait, let me get my chocolate. Um, what was it? Y'all wanted me not to take all the Reese's peanut butter cups or something. Don't take my Reese's. And I went, I just want a couple pieces. And they said, no, really, seriously, take the bowl with you because there's only four of us. We only need one bowl. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> to those who much is given... Much will be required. <laughs> well, you know what? That is so true. We have been given so much grace by God. Amen. And there have been people who have been in our lives who have been such a blessing who told us how to love God. Mamas and daddies and Sunday school teachers and preachers and friends who have gone along in the journey with us who showed us how to love it's our time now to take up the mantle of Jesus Christ and to now be the one who carries the joy and the burden. It is a burden sometimes to be a Christian, isn't it? Because you're not, you can't just sit there on the couch and read your Bible. you got to do something with that faith. Do sit on the couch and read your Bible. Don't get me wrong. Do that part, but don't stop there. Put your faith in action. Carry the mantle of Jesus Christ and reach someone for him. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the blessing that you are to us, for the ways that you pour love into our lives over and over again, for the mothers and fathers of faith who have gone before us, biblical characters, God, who have uh, introduced us to your words, prophets who have spoken forth your truth, and those things have come to pass. And so we know that their truth and their words come from you. Not just those biblical characters, though, but God, people of faith who we have encountered in our lives, who lived for Jesus Christ and showed us what it meant to love. 
Help us, God, to take on the burden, to take on the responsibility, to pick up the mantle of Jesus Christ and to touch another life for you. Thank you, God. Let us get caught up in your spirit. Let us become empowered by your love. Thank you, God. Bless us. Use us in all that we say and all that we do. We pray it all in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.